Good morning, everybody. Good, morning. Good to see you in the house of the Lord today, and we welcome everybody here. So this is the fourth Sunday in the Advent season. Again, I refer to you to the banner over there on your, your right. So the last candle, it's labeled Behold. So uh, this is the Sunday uh, that's closest to Christmas, uh, the Sunday closest to Christmas that's before Christmas. And so it, it has the flavor of a Christmas celebration itself. We just... We just behold the miracle that's about to happen, and uh, especially we think of the miracle of the Incarnation, which Martin Luther called the greatest miracle that God ever performed, the sending of the Son to, be, uh, to come in human form. Okay, don't forget that today is um, a, a communion Sunday, so we want to examine ourselves. See our sin, but also, of course, see our Savior and know that with the bread and the wine, we're receiving not only the body and blood of Christ, but also the full and free forgiveness of all of our sins. Okay, so uh, with those announcements, we'll begin our worship service. And our first hymn is familiar, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. God bless your worship today.
the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am a creature's dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive with Christ even, uh, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In, the, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. Amen. celebration of your birth, that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the first lesson. So our first lesson for today is taken from the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning with verse 8. So this is a prophecy from the great uh, prophet Samuel, and it is referring to the fact that Jesus would be a descendant of the great King David. So sometimes Christ is referred to as great David's greater son, greater of course, because uh, he is God in human form. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on the earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. 
But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So those are the words of our first lesson today. And our sound for today, we will follow the leadership of Andy Luke, and it will be a special arrangement of Psalm 80. Greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. 
But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Now we'll listen to an anthem, again sung by Andy Lewis.
title. So today's sermon text is the Gospel Lesson from Luke chapter 1. Just let me read a couple of verses to refresh your memory on that. So it's the announcement of the angel Gabriel to Mary regarding the upcoming conception birth of Jesus Christ. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. Those are the words that we'll focus on today. In the name of Christ Jesus, dear fellow believers, a miracle is about to happen. Wouldn't you agree? We're going to be going back during this coming week. We're going to be traveling back in time, um, some 2,000 years. We're also going to be going around the world to that area on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. And there, in a sense, we are going to be witnessing the miracle again. The miracle of the in Incarnation. So in the Latin, that word incarnation comes from the Latin word. And in means the same thing it does in the English, in. And carna means body. So it's referring to God coming into a human body. So just think of what that really means. You have, you have the almighty God becoming extremely weak. You have the God who fills the universe becoming super small, about the size of a, a crystal of salt. Okay? So it's really a tremendous miracle. Uh, a great miracle is about to happen. So I thought we would take a look at that. The, this is probably the best text in the Bible to uh, cover that miracle. So our sermon today is entitled, A Miracle is About to Happen. We'll consider three main points. Uh, first of all, that this was a miracle announced by an angel. It was also promised by God. And then lastly, it was accepted. It should be accepted by faith. So the first point is that this is a miracle announced by an angel. So the angel that is in our text for today is the angel Gabriel. So that's a familiar word to you. And you've probably heard of that uh, angel before. He appeared in the life of Daniel. And the angel Gabriel also appeared to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. And here the angel appears to Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. So an angel, that word angelus in the Greek, that means messenger. And so oftentimes the Lord would employ his angels to be messengers. Like when Jesus was actually born, it was the angels that told the shepherds, Christ is born. And so uh, that's why we use that word angel, uh, the word angel from angelos. And the, there are some false teachers in the Christian church. I, I, I may as well be blunt about it. It's in the Catholic church. And they say that these angels, or any angel for that matter, when it appears, uh, when, it, when an angel would appear to Mary, that Mary deserved that. They say, well, Mary deserved to be the mother of Jesus. She deserved to have miracles happen in her life. She deserved the miraculous appearance of this angel because these false teachers claim that Mary herself was born without original sin. Maybe you've heard of something called the Immaculate Conception. That's referring to this false doctrine that Mary was born without original sin. And that she never sinned in her life. Well, we know that to be false. Mary herself referred to her son as her savior. Her savior from what? Her savior from sin and her savior from hell. So Mary herself knew that she was a sinner. And here in this text, she shows that she's a sinner. Because when this holy angel appears to her, she is troubled and afraid the Bible says. She's troubled and afraid. Why is that? Well, that's because she's, she's in the presence of someone who's holy and sinless. And that's just the way it works with us sinful people. When we are in the presence of holy God or even one of his holy angels, we're going to be filled with fear because of the guilt of our sin. 
That's the way it was with Peter. You remember when Jesus walked in the water? And then, toward the end of that same miracle, Jesus entered the boat. And then Peter said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a what kind of a man? A sinful man. See, so that's just the way it works. When sinful people are in the presence of someone who is holy, that would only be God and the angels, then they're filled with fear. And that's why the angel had to say, do not be afraid. The angel had to actually speak the, the gospel to Mary to sort of calm her down a little bit. Well, dear friends, we are also sinful people. I don't have to prove that to you. Um, sometimes I kind of have to laugh a little bit in uh, youth confirmation class, the kids that start out in, in fifth and sixth grade. They get real defensive when we start talking about sin. And I'll say, well, you know, sin would be, for example, like when you lie to your mother or father. Oh, I never lie to my mother or father. I never do that. And I, I kind of smile a little bit, but then I, I realize, yeah, i got some work to do as a pastor here because I have, to, I have to convince these kids before they're confirmed that they are sinners and really need the forgiveness of sins. And that's exactly what happens by eighth grade. All the kids know, okay, you know, I'm a sinner and I need the forgiveness of Jesus. I need my baptism. I need holy communion. So I don't have to convince you of that, that we are sinful people. But maybe you do need the reminder that God has sent you a messengers, uh, several messengers, I should say, in your life. Um, those would be your Christian parents. Did you have Christian parents? Did you have Christian parents that taught you how to pray? Did you have Christian parents who taught you the true meaning of Christmas and what Jesus means to you? Did you have Christian messengers that came to you when you were very young? You know, and the answer for most of you is yes, you had those messengers. Um, we didn't deserve those messengers because of our sinfulness, but God in his grace and mercy sent them to us anyway. And in a sense, we have found favor with God. That's what, that's what the angel said to Mary. You have found favor with God. Why? Because Mary was such a good person? No. Just because of God's grace. Just because he made that decision. God made a decision to give you Christian parents. And if it wasn't a Christian parent who explained Christ to you, then it must have been some other Christian. A Christian pastor, a Christian friend, a Christian spouse. God sent you angels, shall we say, who announced the birth, in a sense, of Jesus Christ, your Savior. Let's always be thankful for that. You know, sometimes I think as Christians, at least I'm like this, I, I sometimes think of myself as unlucky. Um, I, I've been bothered, for example, with high blood pressure my whole life. I walked in the doctor's office when I was 18 years old, and he measured my blood pressure. It was 210 over 110. And he called in all the nurses. He said, look at this, a medical marvel. This kid has this high blood pressure and he's alive. <laughs> and so uh, it's always been a trouble for me. I've had to take lots of medication my whole life just to control that blood pressure. And I always thought, I was like, I'm kind of unlucky. You know, why did that have to happen to me? Yeah. And it kind of limited me in lots of ways. Uh, maybe you're like that too. You think of yourself as unlucky. You say, I got some health problems in the family, either with you or with a spouse or with one of your kids or something like that. Maybe a, a financial venture didn't turn out. You think to yourself as unlucky. Just go back and look at the grace of God to you. How blessed you are that God sent you messengers. Messengers to give you that wonderful gospel which the Holy Spirit worked in your hearts that you would be a believer. Well, the messenger in this case had a message, of course, for uh, Mary. And we'll take a look at that in the second case. Uh, this was uh, a birth that was promised by God. The angel made that very clear. So the angel says in our text, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. So all of those terms that were in that sentence, all those terms that the angel used were what we call messianic terms. In other words, those names occur in the Old Testament over and over again in the Psalms and the writings of the prophets. These kinds of names. Son of the Most High. Throne of his father David. Uh, he'd be a king reigning over the house of Israel, the house of Jacob, and especially this word forever. The eternal reign of, of the Messiah. 
So when the angel mentioned this to Mary, it immediately clicked with Mary. She was a student of the Old Testament scriptures, and she immediately knew. I mean, most Jew Jews would pick this up. Uh, most Jews at that time would pick this up. Oh, those are messianic terms. Now, unfortunately, now Mary doesn't fall in this category, but unfortunately, most of the Jews, they kind of messed up the whole idea of Christ. They, they really emphasized his kingliness, and they did not emphasize the sacrificial aspects of Jesus Christ, sacrificing himself for our sin. And so when Christ finally did come, then most of the Jews didn't recognize Christ. They rejected Christ. And of course, as you know, they eventually crucified him. So they did not give, we have to say, and you know this, that the Jews did not give Christ a very good reception. Mary did, but she was an exception to that. And before we get too upset about the Jews, we have to kind of look to ourselves a little bit. Do we accept Christ? Do we give him a good reception in our life? I just, <clears throat> just to kind of let you know about how this sin takes place in my life, uh, every noon... Rachel and I have lunch. Well, not every noon, but most, most noon meals are privileged that way because I'm a pastor and I'm always home for lunch. So um, after lunch then, Rachel is sitting closest to the little book stand. And so then Rachel takes the devotion book and she kind of puts it right in front of my, right, right, you know, she moves my plate even. And she puts the devotion book right there. So what's she saying? You know, she's saying, Mike, come on. Read, let's read our daily devotions. Now, you might think that that's odd. You might say, well, the pastor, you're the pastor. You know, you should be the guy who really loves home devotions. Well, I have to admit, I don't always. You know, I don't always. Uh, sometimes I think, oh, shoot, she put the book there in front of me again. You know, i got to read this devotion. You know? So we're all like that in our sinfulness. We, we sometimes put our hand up to Christ when he comes to us. And of course, you know, he's going to come in Bethlehem, he's going to come at the end of the time, but he, he also comes to us daily, really. We all have the chance for home devotions. And sometimes people like myself, I say, well, I'm a pastor, what do I need a home devotion for? Uh, some of you guys, you know, you go to a, a Christian school daily, you might say, well, what do I need a home devotion for? I get that at school. So, you know, we're always using excuses to kind of push Jesus away and to push him. But what does God do? What does God do? Did he not come to the Jews then? In grace and mercy, he came to them. He said, well, I, I made a promise. I'm going to fulfill the promise. They're not appreciating me, but I'm going to fulfill the promise. And he also promises to come to us in the word of sacrament. And, and he, he fulfills that, even though we, in our sinfulness, don't always give him the warm reception. So let's celebrate that this Christmas. We worship a God who is so gracious and merciful. So as to send his own son, even when that son is not always enthusiastically welcomed or invited. The last point that we want to remember today is that uh, this is a miracle. The, the incarnation of Jesus is a miracle. All miracles are accepted by faith and they're rejected by unbelief. Every single miracle. Okay? So you can kind of Make a distinction between believers and unbelievers. An unbeliever just says, ah, there are no such things as miracles. That's, that's where we get atheists from, right? They just don't believe in things called miracles. You and I do. And Mary had a little bit of a hard time understanding how this miracle could take place. A miracle is always something supernatural. It, it's outside the, uh, the workings of God's laws of, nature's, of nature. So... All of us kind of scratch our head. How in the world did Jesus walk on water? How in the world did Jesus part the Red Sea? Or did God part the Red Sea? How in the world did he make everything in just six days? And Mary said, how is this going to be that I could conceive a child because I'm a virgin? Verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Now Mary was engaged to Joseph, but she was living a very sanctified life. She did not believe in sex outside of marriage, as no Christian should. And so she fully intended to reserve herself for marriage. And she says, well, I don't get how this could possibly be. I'm a virgin. And the angel then answered and tried to explain as best he could. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. 
So immediately the angel talks about the Holy Spirit. And you know of the three persons in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit who is in charge of giving life. Did you know that? So the Bible clearly teaches that, that, that of the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one who gets life going, whether that's plant life, animal life, or even human life. So it all starts with the Holy Spirit. A lot of times the Holy Spirit uses his laws of nature, okay? So he uses a seed and water and sunshine to get plant life going, using the laws of nature. He uses the cell from the dad, the cell from the mom to come together in conception. Laws of nature coming into place. The Holy Spirit is managing that and empowering that. But in this case, the Holy Spirit would suspend the laws of nature. And instead of using a cell from the a dad and a cell from the mom, he would just use a cell from the mom. And so what happened is that in the conception of Jesus Christ, Jesus received his human nature from his mom and from his mom alone. And he received his holiness from the Holy Spirit and from the Holy Spirit alone. And so this is a wonderful thing, isn't it, that Jesus Christ was born without them original sin and he could be our perfect sacrifice for sin. You know, that was a pretty big thing in the mind of God, that sacrifices had to be perfect. You were not supposed to sacrifice a wounded animal or a diseased animal. Uh, uh, an imperfect sacrifice would not cut it with God. And so it is with the sacrifice, the sacrifice for our sin had to be perfect and had to be completely free of original sin and all other sins. And that started, that gift came to us first with the virgin birth. And then the other thing that happened in the virgin birth is that the Holy Spirit merged the, uh, the life of the, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, and right down into that little tiny baby that was about to be born. In most conceptions, a new person starts. Conception happens, a new person just springs to life. But this conception was different because in this conception, a new person didn't really spring to life. It was an old person. It was, it was the person of Jesus Christ, the eternal God, and who existed from before, he, from before the world began, from all eternity past. And he now just carries on his life, but now it's in the form of a little, tiny baby. And as I mentioned before in today's worship service, that's something you and I can never, can, cannot understand. God is infinite, and this little tiny baby is, is limited, it's finite. But God fills the universe in every way, but this little baby is just in one place at one time. How can this possibly be? We scratch our heads, we just don't know. It's a mystery to us. The Bible tries to explain it in Colossians 2.9, In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. But that doesn't really help us too much. Because we still scratch our head and say, how could this possibly be? That the omnipotent God can become weak. That the omniscient God would become so a little tiny baby that needs to be taught things. How can this possibly be? Perhaps the best explanation is with the words of the angel, verse 37. Nothing is impossible with God. Mary just believed it. That was good enough for her. She just believed it. And the closing verse of our text says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And I know a lot of times we kind of gush over the faith of Mary. We say, oh, Mary, she was just so great. She just believed the angel. She was awesome. Uh, but really we should be giving credit to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit gave her that simple childlike faith. And I know that the Holy Spirit has given you that same faith too. Uh, just yesterday, I had the privilege to say the opening prayer with the Sunday school kids before they had their practice. And I asked them, I said, um, hey kids, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we getting together on Saturdays? And why are we going, you know, memorizing our parts and working so hard at this? Is it to earn our eternal life? Is it to trip so that we can get to heaven? And with one voice, they all said, no, like that. And I tell you, it was the most beautiful no I've ever heard. A lot of times you hear the word no from kids, it's like, oh boy, you know, I don't want to hear that. You know, like my kid, I told my kid to help with the dishes and he said, no. But that was a beautiful no. Uh, they all understood we're doing this to say thanks to Jesus for a gift that he's already given us. Dear friends, a great miracle. 
the incarnation of Jesus. Martin Luther said it's the greatest miracle that God ever performed. Let's be happy this Christmas. Celebrate this wonderful gift that God gives us in his only begotten Son. Amen. Dear friends, we will uh, carry on with our worship service by saying the words of the Nicene Creed, this being a communion Sunday. We believe in one God, the Father, and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's remain standing for our prayer for the church so we have quite a few requests today. So uh, some of you know that Cheryl Alexander um, <clears throat> lost consciousness about a week ago, and there's something wrong with her blood, and they finally got the blood back to normal, but um, she still has not regained consciousness. So they feel pretty confident that she will regain uh, consciousness, but uh, there are some serious problems with her liver and her kidneys. We also want to pray for Carlene Balserowski. She's over the pneumonia now. Uh, but still uh, battling cancer. Don and Wanda Fritch, talked to them last night. They still, uh, COVID symptoms are pretty severe in their case. And Don's cancer is uh, a little bit more aggressive. We're going to pray for Gerald Geiger, the uh, husband of a woman that worships here from time to time. Um, then we'll pray for our communities. So let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers of last week and for granting some improvement from Cheryl Alexander. We <clears throat> ask that this continue so she can have a full recovery. We also pray for uh, Carlene Balserowski and for Don and Wanda Fritsch. If it be your good and gracious will, grant them full health, swift healing. <clears throat> we also pray for Gerald Geiger, asking if it be your will to bring him back to full health. Uh, if this is not your will, Lord, um, then... Shorten the time of his suffering, grant him a peaceful passing into eternal life with Christ. And dear Lord, with all the people that we just prayed for, we ask most of all that you would send your spirit to keep their faith strong. Let them have the confidence that whether they live or die, they are children of God and will not be forsaken. Finally, we pray for our communicants. Bless them as they receive your body and blood, the full and free forgiveness of sins. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation may be seated. <coughs> we'll continue with the order of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father. Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who comes with his Father to make his home in human hearts, working repentance and faith by his Spirit until he comes again. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join in their glorious song.
send your Son, Jesus Christ, and we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood, and preserve us in the true faith. Until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which was shed on the cross for you for all of your sins. The true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthens, preserves, and keeps you in the true faith until life everlasting. You are at peace with God. Your sins are forgiven, and you may depart in peace. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for you for all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for you for all of your sins. The true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthens, preserves, and keeps you in the true faith unto life everlasting. You are at peace with God. Your sins are forgiven. please rise and we will give glory to God through this liturgical song, O Lord, now let your servant depart in peace.
Congregation may be seated just for a couple of announcements. So um, really, I think uh, the only one would be the upcoming services. We do have the offering envelopes for 2021 on the table back there. Uh, special service, you can see Christmas Eve will be 6.30 p.m. That will be a, kind of a typical um, children's service, emphasis on children proclaiming the gospel message, the Christmas gospel. Christmas Day will be the song service that we're used to, uh, readings and carols. And then next Sunday, it would be normal times, including Sunday school and all Bible study. Okay, and so then for this Sunday, you know, we'll be starting here at 9.15 with our Sunday school devotion. Shortly after that, we'll begin our adult Bible study. The adult Bible study today is uh, carrying on uh, Romans chapter 9, about the middle of the chapter, going to the end of the chapter. Okay, those are our announcements today. God bless all of you. Good to see you in worship today, and I'll be happy to greet you outside the parking lot. Today. Good night, you, Father. Yeah.